Welcome, everyone. My name is Isaac Zablocki. I'm the director and co-founder of the Real Abilities Film Festival. And I am a, just to describe myself, I am a um, very pale white man um, on a kind of tan background and a poster of uh, a woman jumping with the words Tel Aviv in yellow behind me. Um, Thank you for joining us for this very special event with, I, I have to say the short films every year at Real Abilities are amazing. And we look for every opportunity to show these again and to give opportunities for people to engage with these amazing movies. And um, we, we have a select few from this year's short films and we're really excited that we had this opportunity in honor of Disability Pride Month um, to present these films and um, and have this very special conversation right now. Um, coming up, we have um, our, um, first of all, next week, we're still in July and we're having a rooftop screening of um, our favorite, one of the, one of our favorite films of the year that we screen virtually. And we said, this is a movie that we want to bring back in person when possible. And there's no better place than our rooftop to screen this, that's the rooftop of the JCC in Manhattan. And um, the film is Adelengi and the Cakes of Versailles. If you haven't seen this, if you have seen it, join us um, Tuesday night at uh, 8.15. We'll be screening this beautiful film on the rooftop. I promise it will make you hungry. Um, and will fulfill you in many other ways. Um, coming up after that in August, we have a premiere of a new Netflix film called Misha and the Wolves about a woman who survived the Holocaust um, by being brought up by a family of wolves. Um, and there's a twist. And then I'm really excited. This film was in Sundance. And then we have one of the Sundance winners from this year, um, Coda, uh, a special preview before it's released on Apple. Um, uh, both a rooftop screening and a virtual screening. So there's no excuse to miss, miss it. And there'll be a conversation with the cast and talent from the film. Um, again, the film is CODA, which stands for Child of Deaf Adults. And it, we will make these screenings, of course, accessible. By the way, this is an accessible event too. So please check out the live captions if you need. Um, and that will be going on August 10th and 11th. We're gonna have the conversation. Um, Academy Award winner Marley Matlin will be joining for the conversation as well, along with many others. She's in the film. Um, the Meaning of Hitler is another preview that we're doing for IFC on our rooftop. And then we're gonna do, we're gonna be part of the release of Not Going Quietly, which was part of Real Abilities this year. Um, that's gonna be on August 17th, another rooftop screening. And finally, to round off the month, we're gonna be, um, screening, doing a part of the release of a film called The Magnificent Meyersons. Um, these will also be accessible screenings as will Not Going Quietly. And we, this film has a disability connection too, but it's just connected to us in so many different ways that um, we had no choice but to show this wonderful independent film that um, will be released at the end of August, running August 20th, um, August 22nd and the 24th in person, August 20th in uh, virtual. Check them all out at jccfilm.org and please help us spread the word. Now, to tonight's event. Um, as I mentioned, our short films are fantastic. We hope you had a chance to see the films from tonight and we have um, some of the filmmakers here with us. Um, I wanna give a huge shout out to Morgan Magid, who's with us tonight who put this entire event together along with uh, Yara Kedem, who runs our Real Abilities International program um, and, and coordinates, uh, they both of course coordinate our New York festival too. And um, we're excited to have a, a new friend of ours to moderate this panel. Um, and I'll let her tell you a little bit more about herself. Um, but uh, Kaya Amara, is going to be moderating and she'll introduce the panel too. If you have any questions um, for our panelists, please put them in the chat or um, raise your hand, make it known and we'll call on you and open your mic so you could ask them in person um, or read it out for you if so you choose. So please be a part of this and I'll hand things over now to Kaya. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Isaac. 
Um, so yeah, as Isaac mentioned, my name is Kaya Amara. My pronouns are they and she. Uh, I am currently on Chumash land, which is in Malibu. Uh, and I am a white person, with sort of short brown hair, wearing a yellow gingham shirt, uh, big uh, headphones, and my lovely sunglasses, since I have some photosensitivity as a part of my disability. So I get to rock these on Zoom all the time. Uh, I am part of, uh, I'm a fellow uh, with Respectability, their entertainment lab for uh, entertainment professionals with disabilities. And I was also a part of their lab the previous year in 2020. And then I also run a production company called Indivisible Entertainment, which focuses on accessibility uh, in production from pre through post. We do all sorts of consulting on productions, consulting on theater. Uh, I myself work as a production accessibility coordinator, which is basically about coordinating the accessibility of a production in a way that's super integrated, uh, which I highly recommend. Uh, uh, and I am so excited to be here mod moderating with Real Abilities for the first time. I actually just came from some moderating with uh, RespectAbility, so mastering the Zoom here and very much looking forward to this conversation. Uh, I was lucky enough to get to uh, say hi to the panelists before everybody on here gets to say hi, and I love all these films. I've seen them multiple times. Isaac mentioned a bunch of great films as well, which I can repeatedly personally vouch for. All of those are awesome too. Going to watch those a second time. So definitely make sure you're coming to those events. Um, but I'm just going to introduce do folks in the order that they are in my screen. Um, and then when you guys come on to speak, I'll let you guys do your introduction of your, your visual description and all of that as well. So we have Delaney Feener. Uh, who's originally from Sacramento, California, and graduated with a BFA from DePaul. So uh, Delaney is a big fan of Shakespeare and does a bunch of things in theater as well, uh, but was part of the feature, Come As You Are, and she is the actress who leads single. Hello, everyone. Um, I am a pretty standard Irish white woman with freckles and um, shoulder length brown, almost black hair. I'm wearing some uh, hoop women body shaped earrings and a black v-neck top behind in front of not behind a white background <laughs> awesome thank you so much delaney uh next we have christopher cosgrove uh who started his career as a video editor in brisbane and then studied directing at the australian film television and radio school in sydney so he's the writer director of boldly go which is actually an autobiographical short film uh, about the challenges of dating with a colostomy bag. So, Chris. Hello. Um, yes, my name's Chris. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Um, I'm a white 35 year old male um, with very pale skin at the moment against a very white wall. Um, short brown hair, a bit of stubble, and I'm wearing a polo shirt, so like the dark green color. And I'm here, yes, I'm in, on Yagara, terrible land in Australia, uh, in Brisbane. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. And last but not least, we have Santina Muha. Uh, she is a creator with Upright Citizens Brigade since 2015, where she's a performer and a host for numerous shows and also an advocate for access there. Uh, she's reoccurred on Netflix's One Day at a Time, and her short film with the Disability Film Challenge was actually nominated for Best Film. So she is the subject of the film Full Picture. Hi, I'm Santina. I have, uh, unlike the other self-proclaimed pale panelists, I have Mediterranean tan skin. I have a uh, dark um, brown, long wavy hair. I'm wearing a black and white dress. And I'm sitting in front of a sort of twinkle light curtain um, and my couch, which my dog is rolling around on. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you much, Santina. If I was back in New York, I would have a lovely twinkle light curtain behind me as well. That's usually all my eyes can take. <laughs> so yeah, I am so excited to have you guys here. Happy Disability Pride Month, as we said. Happy belated Pride Month to anybody who is uh, coming in from the LGBTQ community as well. Um, so this panel is obviously on disability, dating, love is in the air. So I wanted to kick it off just sort of with the first question about disclosure. So obviously all of these films involve disclosure in, in some sense, in multiple senses. Uh, and I was just curious about, you know, how do you personally as filmmaker disclose, be that, you know, specifically in a dating relationship or in relationships in general, or if you're like, nah, I don't do that. I don't disclose. 
And whoever wants to go first can go first. Otherwise, I'll start calling on people. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll go. So um, with, a ver with a visible, a very visible physical disability, which is a wheelchair, which is very hard to hide. Um, you know, it's funny because in the beginning stages of my dating life, I never even considered hiding it because internet wasn't really such a huge part of date, uh, you know, of dating. And so I was meeting guys at school or I was meeting people at, you know, at the mall or something. And so I didn't really have much to disclose. They saw it, they liked it, or they didn't, you know, and now as I'm dating online and things like that, I mean, I've played with d disclosure, but it's not like something I really want to hide because I don't know, it can get awkward. So usually what I'll do is put my first picture, let's say I'm on a dating app. My first picture is not the wheelchair, just something of me. It's still me, it's not a catfish, it's me, but I don't show the wheelchair. And this way they could decide off the bat if they're attracted to the person. And then they can sort of read whatever they wanna read. And then as they go through the photos, the wheelchair comes later. And then if that makes them change their mind immediately, well, then I guess I didn't want that person anyway. Um, and it's happened, you know, and it's happened where I've been messaged with and matched with and they've said, oh, sorry, I only liked you based on the first picture. And then I saw you were in a wheelchair, didn't know, sorry. And I'm like, okay, didn't have to tell me all that, but I guess I appreciate your honesty. Uh, so it, it, a day, online dating has made things a little bit more awkward than meeting in real life. Cause first, you know, for someone whose disability is so visible, um, it's really hasn't been up to me when to disclose. So that's something I'm learning how to navigate as we, you know, as the internet sort of takes over dating. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, oh, go ahead, you, yeah, you covered that beautifully. I'm in a very, very similar situation. I um, have a limb difference. So here it is. Um, I can obviously hide it somewhat on zoom, but um, in majority of the pictures I have of myself, you can see it. Um, and I feel very similar where I think it's actually a really good gauge of person like I would just rather like have it be out there have it be known um specifically through internet dating it's like if your question like right off the bat is some like rude joke comment or like sexual thing in reference to my arm it's like okay great like I can just weed out people really quickly um so I find it's kind of actually like a like a tool yeah to just like weed out the type of personalities I'm kind of looking for um but yeah, I'm in, I'm in the same boat. Anyone I meet in person or anyone that's around me physically, it's not something I can really like hide or cover. Um, so I find in terms of disclosure, it's like a kind of off the bat first thing. It seems very non-personal to me or non-private because it is just kind of first question, first thing. A lot of people, when I first meet them, it's immediately like, what happened to your arm? Were you born like that, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I actually don't, I've never got to kind of play in the world of disclosure very much because I've chosen not to, and also just because of the reality of my disability. Yeah, it's very interesting. So my situation sort of the opposite. So I've got an invisible illness. So I've got a colostomy bag um, from Crohn's disease and I don't at the moment, but I have had for several years, kind of comes and goes. Um, and for me, disclosure very much depended on the circumstances, particularly with dating. Um, if it was, you know, old fashioned face-to-face -face dating, it might not be something that you bring up until second or third day um but online dating particularly you know, i'm gay so in like gay sort of hookup culture online apps mm -hmm. um there's a real sort of heavy bias towards the physical appearance on a lot of those apps um and so i did find that i it helped me if i disclosed definitely before someone came over to see me in real life um like you know, say before they arrive, hey, I want to let you know now. And um, just like Delaney was saying, it was a really good way to filter out nasty people that you probably don't want coming mm -hmm. over anyway. So, and that <laughs> did happen sometimes. And you get comments and you're like, okay, well, flick, I don't need you. So um, in some ways, it actually was a very powerful tool because it let you sort of, it also let you fast track sometimes in terms of intimate connection because it's forced you to reveal something about yourself quite personal very early on. And that sort of sometimes actually helped in a sense because it's sort of advanced you a few steps forward beyond just you know what's the weather like today <laughs> I love that I also love that everybody on this panel is coming from that place of like if they said the thing I didn't like I was like all right bye I don't need to talk to you anymore so I have uh I have a follow-up off of uh, something Santina said which is basically about this idea of like 
the catfish or the accidental catfish, um, which is, you know, I took a picture of me and you can't see my disability in it. I am also a very passing person. I have an invisible illness as well. Um, so I have, you know, that relationship with disclosure that's very similar to Chris's, but you still end up in that situation sometimes of, you know, did I catfish you? And was that catfish intentional or not? And I was wondering if you guys have had any, you know, experiences where, you know, you weren't catfishing anybody, you didn't hide something. It was just, you know, a picture of you that didn't show this or uh, a day when you were feeling this way and they just didn't happen. They didn't happen to catch it. But what that experience was like for you on the receiving end of somebody, you know, telling you that you were catfishing them or feeling like you had, you had, participated in that? You know, it's like people are always hiding things about themselves anyway. So like, uh, what what is catfishing? You know, is it not telling something, every single thing about you up front? Because I've gone out with guys two, three times and they've told me that they're not divorced yet. And it's like, well, did they catfish me because they held that piece of information? No, I mean, right, so yeah. So I don't, I mean, it's not really answering the question, but it's like, what is catfishing? Right. It's like, you know, it's like, if it's you, if it's you, but not every part of you, then I don't think that's a catfish because we're not all showing up with like our medical history or our <laughs> dating history. Or whatever, right. Right. Know. Well, yeah. Well, and I think to go off that, it's like, uh, ideally if we were living in like, um, a society that was perhaps not ableist yeah. that wouldn't be a shock or like that shouldn't be a shock is that it's like I sh I should be showing up and like no matter what you're seeing that's what a first date's for you're gauging how you feel about the person if I show up and you know if you're immediately like I'm not interested because you have a disability again it's like okay then I'll just walk away but it is that thing where I think in a first date you're both like playing off each other, seeing if you like each other, see if you vibe. And I don't think um, anyone that would frame that as a catfish, I would say is a red flag, right. in my personal opinion. Um, but yeah, I think uh, also too many people focus on it. Um, I've had this reaction, not through dating, but just through life where it's like, when I've been in an event, like a panel or something, and they've posted a picture where it's like, I'm with other people. So my arm's hiding or whatever. And then when people see me, it's just like, oh my God, I, I didn't even realize that. And it's like all they want to talk about. And, you know, it's just, you kind of roll with the punches to a certain extent, I think. But yes, I think anyone perceiving not disclosing your disability off the bat is like very ableist mindset. I, I think that comes from media a lot too, because when you see somebody with a disability, well, for me growing up, whenever I'd see someone with a disability dating on TV, at the whole episode was about that, you know? Like I remember this episode of mm -hmm. Duke and Howard MD that my mom taped for me because she was like, cool, look, a girl in a wheelchair. But what happens is Doogie meets the girl in a pool. <laughs> he asks her on a date. When he shows up to the date, she's in a wheelchair. Now Doogie Howser, and he's shocked. Remember he was a doctor? He was a doctor. Right? <laughs> I'm like, if, if the doctor is shocked, then we're really dealing, you know, because Zach Morris, yes. there was an episode of Stay by the Bell where Zach was shocked, but Zach was an idiot. You know, he was shocked about everything. Yeah. He, he had a problem with yeah. every girl that wasn't healthy. <laughs> and rightfully so, they were made for each other. But Doogie was a doctor. So what was his problem with the girl being in a wheelchair? And so I felt like, yeah, like, oh my God, am I so shocking that when I enter a room, it's like, <gasps> and that's, and you know, like Delaney right. said, the thing, the only thing I like about a guy not knowing about my disability up front is that I, he, he's not in the back of his head thinking about it and he can get to know me first. And then yes, of course, we're gonna have to talk about it, obviously, but, but first let's get to know me the person before you put everything through the disability filter, which is what people do because there's just not enough normalization, unfortunately yet, especially yeah. when it comes to dating and sexualization and all that, you know? Mm -hmm. I had a guy recently message me. He wanted to know if I could, I'm sorry, you know, I don't want to get too vulgar, but if I could have an orgasm, because giving a woman an orgasm is something that he must do. It is a deal breaker for him if he can't. And I'm like, does this guy really think he's given every girl he's ever dated an orgasm? <laughs> I don't think, so. I hate to break it to him, but I doubt it, you know? And then, but then of course, like, like I said, I was like, bye-bye, you know, I didn't even answer. Yeah, totally. 
Yeah, it is fascinating. This is like a bit of a tangent, but just because you brought it up, the like vulgarity of certain people, like, I guess it's the audacity too, right? Where it's like, you're going to open with like a sexual question in regards to my disability. Like that is so bizarre to me. And I always am like, you know, what reaction are you expecting? Like, and I think a lot of it is like fetish, fetish, fetishization to a certain extent. And so in their head, maybe they think you're as like fascinated with as it, as they are. And it's like, no, this is my body. <laughs> I live in this every day. Um, so yeah, it is, it's, it's shocking the etiquette people um, step into um, through online dating. I know in general, everyone kind of deals with the vulgarity thing, but um, again, it's just like this, this complete disconnect that happens too often. I mean, he hadn't even asked me what college I went to, like nothing. He just presumed we were just having sex someday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, uh, yes. No. The, no. the joys of uh, internet interactions now that uh, that's, <laughs> that's a, a lovely thing with COVID now too. Chris, I'm super interested to hear as well if you have any sort of specific relationship with this sort of, you know, shock factor or as Delaney said, like fetishization or anything like that. Or if you're like, uh, I get to, uh, I avoid most of that. Or if you're like, no, here's an experience I've had. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I've fortunately been pretty lucky. I haven't had any sort of like catfishing exper experiences where someone thought that was happening. Um, certainly early on when I was first kind of learning to go on dates and things, and I did have an ostomy and I was really young, like, you know, early 20s, um, and navigating how to do that disclosure conversation. And certainly at the start, I was too scared to kind of say something online and it wouldn't be till I was sort of literally with someone where you're taking your shirt off, which is sort of what the film's about. You sort of have to have that very rapid conversation because it's going to happen no matter what. Um, and, you know, fortunately for me, whenever I was in that circumstance, generally everyone was just sort of happy to be there. So we kind of just rolled with it. Um, but certainly online was sort of where I've encountered more, um, yeah, bigotry or a small mindedness or whatever. Um, and like I said, fortunately, that is a bit of a filter. It doesn't mean it doesn't still hurt when you encounter it, um, but that particularly because it is such a vulnerable experience just meeting new people in any sort of circumstance um and so particularly when it's also something that for me in my case my disability was like connected to an actual like trauma it was something you know I, I had a was very very sick um when I was 21 and um was in intensive care and so the the disability was connected with like an actual um you know, trauma that I was still healing from. And so it's particularly um, nerve wracking kind of exposing that nerve, I guess. Um, and so the moment you get any sort of rejection from it, it does set you back a little bit and you kind of, you know, have to go away and rebuild your courage before you dive back in. So um, yeah, internet dating is a wild world at the best of times, but yeah, I certainly think even more tricky people with disabilities. Yeah, well, speaking of trauma too, it's like my car accident, was a traumatic experience. I mean, I'm. I, it, it was a long time ago, but it's not something I like to dig up and talk about. But when somebody asks me about it, I'll answer, but then I don't come back to them and say, well, what happened, you know, did your dad love you? Or like, what's something that was traumatic in your life that we can talk about now? Because mm -hmm. that's not, you know, in first, second, third date conversation, usually the deep stuff, but my deep stuff is right out there. So let's just talk about it off the bat. And I'm like, I yeah. barely know you yet, you know? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there is like an attitude of owness, um, like of that like you owe that explanation to people because like you're the odd one out and that you're the one that's different. So like you owe me the full breakdown and it's like, no, <laughs> that's not how this should work. Um, but yeah, absolutely, I agree with both of you. I feel like on that note, I wanna, I, we always, especially in film, we talk a lot about, you know, minority stories and how much are we talking about the trauma of being a minority story or, you know, whatever sort of minority group that is. Um, and I know we have intersectionality within this panel as well, but I wanna flip it a little bit and say, okay, we talked about like shocking experiences, bad experiences. We talked about the red flags, which I think is great again for anybody who might listen to this panel. What was something that was shocking to you that made you go, oh my goodness, that is the response that I have always wanted and I didn't know. I know I have that response for me personally where I, 
I, you know, same thing. I have a chronic illness. I started having an episode. I literally threw up in somebody's car and like had a seizure on a highway. And at the end of the whole episode, the person went, wow, you know, I really feel like, I feel like we shared an intimate moment. And like, I really loved that moment with you. And I was like, that's what I want. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. I had no idea that that's what I wanted was somebody to say, wow, I had an intimate experience with you. And that was really cool. So that was like, a green flag, if you will. I want to know if you guys have had any any green flag moments. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big um, physical touch person. And so uh, I don't have actually like a, a phrase or a moment where something was said kind of as lovely as that. Um, but I do think when I date people, um, just like holding my arm and like touching my arm and not being a afraid of it um or afraid to interact with it like it's any other body part you know like when you're in a romantic relationship you're holding hands a lot you're holding arms you're touching all the time and I've literally dated someone for like, 10 months who like never touched my arm and it was not a red flag that I was aware of until I got out of that relationship and I was like that is insane like that is absolutely absurd that that man never touched my arm like that is next level to me. And so, um, not that it's like a pass or fail test or anything, but, um, I found the people that I have felt the most comfortable or safe with are people who just integrate that as they would any other form of touch on any other type of body part. Yeah. I think integration is the, the best word because that's, I feel the same way. I recently, um, went out with someone and, you know, I like when, when, it, when they ask, you know, someone, do you want me to push you? Oh, no, thank you. Okay. And then they, they leave it. You know, I, I can't with someone who just automatically starts pushing me or doesn't believe me when I say I don't need help or they're like, Ooh, what do I do? You know, it's like so uncomfortable. I actually went on the guy recently though, where we went on three dates and the wheelchair didn't come up at all. And I started to be like, what is happening? I, I felt like I was going a little bit nuts. I'm like, is this, I mean, I talked to my therapist. I'm like, what do I do? And then I didn't know how to bring it up. And then I was like, Hey, uh, I just wanted to ask you, do you know I'm in a wheelchair? And cause we had a perfect <laughs> yeah, it was like during quarantine and he was like, Oh yeah, yeah, I know. And I was like, Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, and then the way he handled it was really good. He was like, you know, I don't, he said, it's not that I don't care. I, I, I care, but I don't, you know, it's something that's your, personal business and in term you can bring it up when you want to bring it up so I was like okay good that felt good but also yeah. I the lead up to it almost got too much so now I try to incorporate or integrate it like Delaney said somewhere in the first date just casual calm so that I don't get in my head about it like does he think it was a a costume or a role I was playing or did he not get it or I, I don't know I started to get really in my head yeah yeah yeah, I've um, had a sort of positive green flag um, sort of recently, like I um, started dating someone sort of maybe like six months after I made this film. And so even making this film was a bit of a green flag because it meant then, you know, people had actually seen the film that were some of the people that were sort of in the same world that I was dating with. So the, my current boyfriend, we've now been together almost two years. Um, I think that obviously helped. He'd seen the film. Um, and uh, I remember early on in one of our you know, early dates, um, something embarrassing happened. I think it was, I think I had, I was really sick. I had, I'd been vomiting or whatever. And I was embarrassed about that. And he said something which is really sweet. He just said, oh, don't worry. It's just human bodies doing human body things. And I remember thinking, and he just said it so earnestly, it's just human bodies doing human body things. And I was like, oh, if that's your whole like paradigm around like, you know, physical health or, you know, physical bodies, um, you're the right person yeah. to be with. So yeah, that was really comforting at the time. <laughs> that's so lovely. <laughs> I love that, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, I have one last question and then I wanna open it up to questions from everybody else, but uh, this sort of question about, you know, interacting with people for the first time and something that, like you said, you had this expectation of the conversation that was going to happen or like your mind was telling you that it was going to be coming and then it wasn't. What are sort of those, uh, and I mean, obviously this happens in full picture as well of the, the bias on the other side. Um, what places do you feel like you found yourself in where you had an expectation of the other person that either, you know, was met or wasn't met? Mm 
Mm. I mean, uh, this is so simple, but height always got like when you meet somebody online and then you meet <laughs> in person, it's hard to gauge their height. And, um, and it's like, sometimes it throws me off, but I would never be like, how dare you? You made it seem like you are <laughs> this ridiculous out of here. But I have had to like recalibrate in my own mind. Like, am I still attracted to this person? Okay, good. Okay, good. You know, right. because and then sometimes I say to myself, or I'll say to my friends, if I'm not attracted to someone, and you know, this is my own stuff that I'm working out with therapy too. But like, I'll say, yeah, I wasn't really attracted to him, but you know, like who am I to like, I'm in a wheelchair and I'm going to complain that he's a little bit this or that. And they're like, no, 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 no. You don't have to do that. If you're not attracted to them, that's okay. But I do that sometimes where I feel like I, how can I complain that a guy is a little heavier than his picture or shorter than his picture? Like where well, all my friends complained about that stuff, you know? And like I said, if you really are into a guy, it's not going to matter either way. So that's just sort of a little you know, signs that you're not into them completely. It's if you're in love with someone, it's not gonna matter that they're whatever, not what you were picturing. But um, I have had to sort of tell myself, it's okay to not be attracted to someone or have sort of a shallow or vain, a shallow reason for not wanting to date them. I don't have, it's, but sometimes I tell myself, oh, you really, that's rich. You're gonna tell somebody you're not exactly perfect when you're in a wheelchair and I have you know that's not fair to myself so that's just something I don't know if you guys feel the same way but I've dealt with it yeah no absolutely I was gonna say um not that I don't have uh I do have very high expectations but I think on on, on terms of first meeting expectations I actually just think that because I have a disability which um can sometimes lead to speed bumps and whatnot I kind of go in very open to anything um and not in the sense of what you were saying I have those feelings as well where I'm like well I can't actually have standards because I'm disabled which is yeah lots of therapy uh, <laughs> but um it is this thing of like I think my expansion for acceptance is massively larger than the general public simply because I'm on the receiving end of a lot of bias so it's like when someone walks up and is shorter than their profile says, or, or yeah, heavier or what have you, or just looks a little different than like the hottest picture that, that everyone puts their best picture on online dating things. Like we all know this. Um, I think there's, there is a lot of just kind of acceptance and going with the flow because of who I am as a person. And quite frankly, even in terms of dating history and everything, the line of men that I have been with all look very different in terms of like, height, race, weight, everything. And I, and I think it is, um, I have to somehow attribute that a little bit to my arm because there's this thing that I know, I just want people to see me for the person that's not my body. And so it's like, I have to offer that same grace and that same openness to other humans as well. Yeah, it's interesting, Delaney. I've thought similar in the past that I, um, do you think it's one of those little secret superpowers perhaps to being anyone who's been from a minority is that you tend to be more open or accepting just in general with, with public and strangers? Because um, you've got totally. that empathy of you've experienced what it's like to be kind of experienced prejudice. Um, so, yeah, I've certainly been on dates where, you know, the person arrives like, oh, you look a lot older than what was in the photo or you, you look <laughs> quite different. But rather than just saying that out loud, it's like, no, I'm going to give this person a chance. Maybe there's a reason why they thought I'm comfortable sharing that. You know, you're a lot more sort of willing, like yeah. you said, to go with the flow. And that's probably from our own personal journeys. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I, I completely agree. And there's also a, a little voice in my head sometimes that, this is going to sound a little bit maybe shallow or vain, but just, you know, it, it's like, it's afraid to be with someone who's different because it like, I, this is, I don't want society to think, Oh, well, that's how cute. Look at the little two little misfits found each other. And I don't mm -hmm. want that to be the case. I hate that that's even in there. And I, I, you know, I, I ignore it and it's, it's not, it doesn't win. But I hate that that it's even in there, you know, that that voice that's like, and I don't have it with my friends and I don't have it, but it, with dating, 
it's like a thing where I want people to know I can get someone just as great as, but I've also been single right. for five years. So I probably, you know, I can't, but I will. Don't well, worry. yeah, but in, I mean, in single, uh, the part I played of Kim was uh, very, very different from I, who I think that I am in the world. Um, a lot more aggressive, a lot more blunt, like very much kind of like in my dreams who I wish I was on certain days. Um, <laughs> And that whole, like, in the script, we have that exact issue where it's, like, she is face-to-face. And, like, you see, Jordan is so hot. Like, Jordan looks so good in that movie. And still, like, it's, like, the the battle of, like, right, but we're still, like, the couple with limb differences. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be a thing that everyone talks about for the rest of our lives. And I, I, it it kind of was a, a reveal for me personally to have some of those thoughts as well, where you know, you don't want to address it or you don't think about it actively. So you don't know that it's there. And then when I received that script, I remember being like, that is such a good point that it's, it's not a reaction of, I mean, it could be a reaction of your own internalized ableism in general, but I do think it is just like more the reaction of like, I want to prove to other people that like we can both get quote normal people in the world. And you know, the irony of that, again, is that it's like, quite frankly, being with someone that has a different disability than you could probably be wonderful and so much easier in a lot of ways. Um, but there is, yeah, that that fear or that, because it feels like you're, you're um, outing yourself more, right? It's like, it's, I'm enough in public and people notice me enough. And then there's two of us, like, it's going to be like a circus, it, you know, it, it feels very much that way. Um, so yeah, I hear that too. I, I love that. On that note, too, I think I, I love that all of your experiences are echoed wow. in each other's films as well. I think that's something that's so great uh, about about all of these films is, is how much they connect. But we are very close to uh, nearing the end of our time. So I'm going to pass it off to Morgan and make sure that we can get some questions from the audience as well for you guys. Hi, everyone. Um, I have not uh, introed myself, but I am Morgan. I'm the program manager for Real Abilities. Um, I'm a white woman with some uh, with a brown hair pulled back in a ponytail and a white t-shirt. Um, there are my closet doors behind me, which are also white. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna give the audience one last chance to, to throw some questions our way. Um, so in the meantime, first I wanna thank everyone for just being so vulnerable um, with their stories and, and talking about the ways that their identities and their and disability kind of play into their their dating and love lives, um, and again, while we're waiting for 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 some audience uh, participation here, we we'd love to have you all. Um, I mean, I'd love to know. Um, I mean, Delaine, you kind of touched on this, like how your character is a bit different, um, like how yourself was different from Kim in the film. Um, I mean, I'd love to hear from you, like. Did you like what else did you maybe take away from playing someone with her um, perspective? And then for Chris and Santina, like both of you are are very much in the film as well. I think like Chris, you wrote and directed it, and Santina, you're obviously the subject, um, and like are, are working a lot on the um, you know making sure the film gets out there and, and you know kind of producing things now and making sure kind of your story and perspective gets told. Um, I mean, maybe start with Delaney because that was the first thing I mentioned, but. We'll go to Chris and Santina after about, you know, how putting themselves in the films was like what that experience was like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I think um, a lot of there's there's some internal stuff that I definitely uh, related to and recognized in Kim. Um, from when I was younger, from when I was more of a teenager, I felt a lot of that kind of angst, especially like early on with dating that feeling of like, everyone's looking at you constantly and it's not for the reasons that you want. And every, every comment that anyone could say to you, regardless of it, it is about your disability or not feels like it is. Um, so I remember that ringing very true. And in a lot of ways, um, I loved her just like unabashedness to, to say that and to speak on that and to be kind of an asshole in a lot of ways (laughs) to a lot of people, because I think sometimes I take on the overly opposite role of like smiling and laughing and like making sure everyone feels comfortable because I don't want me to be the discomfort. Um, So I think there's a lot of beauty in that, but 
I um, definitely loved, and we kind of mentioned this really way at the beginning, but the sexual side of Kim, um, I really, really connected with that in my personal life. I feel like um, you never see it on film. Like you never see people with disabilities being sexy, like having a sex life, dating and like feeling confident and all of that. And so I think that was definitely the side I clicked with more. And there was actually um, an initial version of the script where Jake and Kim did hook up at the end of the movie. We ended up changing it, but we kind of wanted to have, um, similar to Chris's film, like a sort of sex scene or, or, or physical intimacy scene, um, because it is so crucial, I think, to show that that exists and that is a part of our life as much as anything else. Thanks. Um, Chris, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah um for me it was definitely I think I felt like a sense of ownership through making the film in terms of my disability um and from the outset I very much like Delaney was saying I was aware that it just wasn't visible I, I didn't have anything when I was going through that experience to reference in terms of screen stories or media I'd never seen a I think the only time I'd seen a Cosby bag on screen was in an episode early on of Sense8 and it's like a throwaway joke and it's not even like actually functional. Like what, when the character does, like, can I actually do that with a Cosby bag? Uh, so I wanted to kind of have a sense of not only just visibility, but, you know, just put it in a real normalised sort of environment um, was important for me. Um, but in terms of what I guess I've kind of got out of the experience, one, I've had lovely messages from people around the world on different Facebook groups or things. I've just got emails out of the blue from people, you know, that have lived a similar experience and just said how important it was and how, you know, um, how touching it was for them to see their, their own story kind of on screen. Um, you know, particularly that, I guess, small little Venn diagram of, um, you know, gay men who have a colostomy, um, it, that definitely it's a very specific, I guess, story um and so people that had gone through that experience were like this was really important so thank you um but for me what i also got out of it um apart from the film itself was as a like someone who wants to be a filmmaker i guess what i've struggled with over my 20s being in and out of hospital is just this doubt of can i even do this like with my disability um and so that was a real sort of like watershed moment even though it was really hard to do it to get it done and over the line and a lot of stop start it kind of was conf like really helped boosted my confidence of, yeah, I can do this. And maybe it's not the same way that my other peers might do it. Um, you know, navigating any career part-time with disability is different, particularly in film and television. It's like, there's this mindset of a way it has to be done where everyone works these like 70 hour weeks or whatever. So um, trying to find a different model of how to do it to actually work with the people that are on the team. Um, and for me, it was the first moment where I got that. It was like, yeah, there is a way to do this. Um, and so that was part, really kind of helped bolster my confidence that I might be able to actually you know, make more films in the future, which was really nice. I hope we do. Santina, I'd uh, love to hear from you as well. Yeah, you know, I have always thought back about how in elementary school, my disability was nobody cared. In fact, they almost thought it was cool. You know, it wasn't a big deal. And then once I got to middle school, that's when it started to change. And that's when everybody asked me, oh, what is that thing? And how do you do this? And how do you have sex and blah, blah, blah. But after doing full picture, I realized, wait a minute, it, it's not everybody. It's, it's the guys and, or, or, you know, or it's the people that are looking at me, it's, it's the circumstance. So it happens in professional settings when someone's looking to hire me or something and it happens in dating and it, you know, and then probably in child rearing, I'm sure it, well, once I have a child, people are gonna wonder how can you do that? So, but in my friendships with my girlfriends, it really hasn't been an issue. And I didn't realize that until I did full picture because in middle school, when I think back to my relationships with my girlfriends, they weren't like, can you sleep over? How does that work? Can you go to the mall? They were just like, we're going to the mall. We're sleeping over. We're going to this Manhattan. We're, you know, we're, we're writing notes. We're talking about boys. Like it wasn't an issue for them at all. And that's when I started to realize, wow, it's really more circumstantial than I realized. I just figured everybody who didn't have a disability was like, what's that like? But it's not, it, 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 it really, and there are certain people who just are curious and whatever, but it really has to do with, like I said, those dating, 
job hiring, they probably, I think child rearing and driving, you know, things like that. But it's not so much the people that want to be my friend that are really interested or curious about it at all. And that was really enlightening to me. I didn't, I just wasn't filtering it through that. I just had, was lumping everybody together. And I really appreciated that, uh, that that's what I learned from, from doing the film. Thank you. Um, folks, I, I think that's going to be all for us tonight. Um, I want to thank Kaya Amara again for moderating this awesome conversation. And again, just thanking all the filmmakers and actors, every, all of our panelists. Um, your work is so essential to us at Real Abilities, and we hope you know we'll, we'll see more from you all in the future. Um, folks, uh, I hope you all join us the rest of the next couple of weeks as well. Again, don't miss Not Going Quietly and CODA and, and so much more. Um, submissions to the 2022 festival are open now, so tell all your friends that are filmmakers. Um, we want to see them see them in our next next year's summer screenings too. Um, have a good night. Uh, see you see you at the next screening, all. Bye.